Imagine having an idea and spending a full year passionately pitching that idea to investors. And then imagine being rejected over a hundred times. How long can you last? Can you even keep going? That's the story of how Melanie Perkins and Clifford Albrecht built Canva, the Australian startup that's currently valued at over $40 billion and is perhaps the easiest graphic design platform to use when creating social media posts, business cards, YouTube thumbnails, you name it. It's like Photoshop but without the complexity. This story is like a dream come true for a lot of entrepreneurs because Melanie Perkins started this with her then boyfriend turned now husband Clifford Obrecht. They both still own around 30% of Canva and are now worth around $6 billion each. The origin story of Canva inspires me because it's different from all the other tech startup stories since Melanie Perkins and Clifford Obrecht weren't programmers. They didn't have high net worth parents, they didn't have the connections, and they weren't based in the US. They both simply saw a need that needed to be filled. They felt that creating simple designs were too complicated, and they weren't collaborative, and they weren't done online. She felt that the future of design was kind of like a Google Docs version of Photoshop. And so despite not having the connections, the capital, and technical expertise, Melanie Perkins and Clifford Obrecht simply took everything one step at a time and made things work. And that's why I'm excited to talk about Canva. My name is Chris Garin and this is Brand Origins. In 2006, Melanie Perkins used to work part-time teaching design at the Design University of Western Australia. And as she was teaching her students, she was annoyed with how there were simply so many moving parts when making simple visuals. Her teaching job gave her an outsider's perspective of how disproportionate the learning curve was when it comes to graphic design. For one, you needed to have Adobe Photoshop installed in your computer. And if you're new to Photoshop, seeing all the buttons and settings, that by itself can already be overwhelming. And we're not even talking about the design aesthetics, okay? Just learning how to use the tool alone is already intimidating. And Melanie Perkins pointed out that it's all being done offline. And so if you're working with the team or if you're a designer and you needed to get a project approved, what you would normally do is to save the file, send the file to your boss via email, and he would send it back to you with some comments. And so Melanie Perkins was thinking, what if it kind of functioned like Google Docs, where it was all done online on your browser and where multiple people can see the project being edited in real time and team members from anywhere else in the world can edit the same project? That would be so convenient. And Melody Perkins felt that there was something here. There was an opportunity here. But then she did also know that this whole idea of disrupting an entire industry dominated by the likes of Adobe, Google, Microsoft, this was a big and daunting task. And so she thought, what if we start small? What if we create a version of this, but one that's only designed to help people design their yearbooks? She decided on yearbooks because one, her mom was a teacher and she saw how much time and effort she spent on each yearbook. And two, it was usually school teachers who are in charge of working on this. And they're the types of people who have no design experience and they're expected to create something professional. Their initial plan was to create this new web app, allow people to design yearbooks for free. And when they were done designing, users can pay them to have their yearbook printed. So in a way, Canva kind of started out as a printing press. And it actually didn't start out being called Canva yet. At this point, they called the business Fusion Yearbooks. This would eventually evolve into Canva's Chef. And what's funny was that when they landed on the name Canva's Chef, Clifford Albrecht said that he absolutely hated it. But then one of their French engineers explained that Canvas was pronounced Canva in French. And that's how they ended up with the name Canva. So anyway, along with her boyfriend Clifford, they went to work. They borrowed $50,000 from friends and family, and for their marketing budget, they used the $5,000 from the government after a tax thing. Then they started looking for a software development company that could build their idea. And what's amazing is that Melanie Perkins kind of had this 80-page plan on what exactly the software should do. Like she said that she sketched out what the pages looked like and what each button should do. The project ended up becoming five times bigger than what it initially should have been, and this whole development phase took around six months to build their first iteration. As the program was being developed, they managed to secure printers from Fuji Xerox. And we're talking about big printing press type of printers, okay? Apparently, what happened was as they were promoting this project, Fuji Xerox saw the potential of this thing becoming a big printing press someday. And so they gave them the printers as long as they pay for the ink. And so Melanie Perkins just had a bunch of these printers in their living room. Eventually, they were able to launch, and within the first year, they got 16 schools using their yearbook design software. This eventually grew to 50 schools 
in year two and a hundred schools in year three. Now, this was already a good standalone business. But as I said earlier, Melanie Perkins knew that this was only the first step of an even bigger goal. And that's when she met Bill Tai. Bill Tai is a venture capitalist from Silicon Valley or a VC. VCs invest in startups and Bill Tai happened to be in Australia for a conference. This guy is no small fish, okay? He invested in Zoom and Wish shopping. Now, when Melanie Perkins heard him speak, it opened her mind to the world of startups. That's sure. Having a business is good, but startups are out there disrupting industries and changing the flow of how things are done. Just so you know, Melanie Perkins said that she's a true introvert. But in the How I Built This episode, she said that when she has a goal, she will break through the limits of her own introversion just so that she can reach that goal. And so after the conference, she went up to Bill Tai, introduced herself, shared what she had in mind, and Bill Tai said, you know what, if you happen to be in San Francisco, Let's meet up. Right there, she knew how big an opportunity this was. And so without having a plan, without even booking a plane ticket to San Francisco, she just winged it and messaged Bill Tai. Hey, I'm gonna be in Silicon Valley. I'm gonna be in the area. Wanna catch up? I love how she made it seem so casual as if the whole Bill Tai meeting was an afterthought even though it was the only reason why she was going there. Bill Tai said yes and Melanie Perkins headed for the US and her plan was to stay at her brother's place and wrap things up in two weeks. So then she went to work on her pitch. And what's funny was that the business plan she made wasn't like a PowerPoint presentation. She physically printed it and she said that she realized how uncool this was. And check out one slide of her actual pitch. The pitch was entitled The Future of Publishing. And wow, just it's so cool just thinking about this because she really made it happen. When she was making her pitch to Bill Tai, she said that she felt like such a failure because he was on his phone the whole time. But it turns out he was on his phone because he was already messaging his network looking for a tech team that can help Melanie Perkins out on this project. He ended up introducing Melanie Perkins to Lars Rasmussen, a co-founder of Google Maps. Lars would end up becoming one of her first advisors. And the good news is that he said he would invest, but only if Melanie Perkins can find herself a tech team. Remember that she isn't an engineer and programming wasn't her thing, so she needs to build her tech team. If this was a movie, this is the part where a montage happens because Melanie Perkins pretty much just approached every single person she ran into, made her pitch, and asked people to be part of her tech team. But sadly, after three months, she couldn't find anyone. She recalls feeling like a complete failure as she flew back to Australia and she remembers listing down all the things she achieved during the trip to the US and the only thing she could write was staying alive. Her boyfriend Clifford was successfully running the yearbook printing operation back home and so she felt like he was doing his part but she failed to do hers. But then after some time, she had another shot. Bill Tai is big on kite surfing, and he has this kite surfing getaway event in Maui where it's basically a mix of startup conferences and talks in the morning and kite surfing stuff in the afternoon. So Bill Tai invites Melanie Perkins, but then she didn't know anything about kite surfing. But then she was like, oh, I'd love to. I love kite surfing. And then she went ahead and took kite surfing lessons. Both Melody and Clifford went. They knew that this was their chance to get in front of potential investors. And there was this one event the following day and they asked if they could pitch their idea. And then they spent the entire night preparing and rehearsing their pitch. And it turned out pretty well because it got them a lot of interest. They got a lot of I'm interested in talking further about this, but still, no commitments and no checks. But this gave them a bit of momentum. After Maui, they went back to San Francisco. It was time for round two. They once again started pitching to everyone. And I love this part because you can really feel the intensity of Melanie and Clifford's desire to make this happen. So as they made pitch after pitch, VCs would have objections. And so they would use this and go refine their pitch deck. They made sure that the most difficult questions would be answered right at the start of the presentation. And so in a way, she was kind of grateful that they were getting rejection after rejection because they were kind of forced to really get to know and understand every moving part of their product. In the span of a year, Melanie Perkins recalls having pitched to over a hundred potential investors. I don't know how she did it, but when she was asked how she was able to deal with this, she said that she was just really confident with the idea that she had. She knew that this was the future. She was a thousand percent sure that the future of design was absolutely not going to be desktop based. It was all gonna be online. There was simply not an ounce of doubt that this wasn't gonna work and this kept her going. Perhaps the biggest factor that stopped VCs from investing was that she didn't have a tech team yet. But then the stars finally aligned and man, they aligned beautifully. So Lars Rasmussen, their advisor, asked this guy Cameron Adams to go and talk to them. 
Melanie told him the grand plan and Cameron couldn't shake the idea off of his head. And so he joined the couple with Melanie great at design, Clifford in business, and now Cameron in tech, they had everything they needed to disrupt the industry. Cameron Adams eventually became their third co-founder. The last member of their dream team was completed when Dave Herndon joined the team. Melanie Perkins shared how she went through the Facebook page of Dave Herndon, grabbed a couple of funny pics, and added it to her pitch. And this convinced him to join the team. As soon as these guys entered the team, investing in Canva became a no-brainer and funding came in almost immediately. After a year of being rejected over a hundred times and receiving no funding, the tide had turned and they were oversubscribed, receiving almost $3 million in funding. Around 2012 to 2013, the team was working tirelessly to make the first version of Canva, and Melanie Perkins was obsessively making sure that everything was perfect. In fact, this may have taken a bit too long to the point that investors were starting to get worried. As they were nearing their launch date, there was a lot of hype around Canva. They've already had a big following from their yearbook business and they've been featured on a lot of websites, TechCrunch being one of them. And as the launch date neared, Melanie Perkins shared that one of the worst moments was when just right before their launch, someone leaked Canva. I don't know how, but an article came out with a horrible review of Canva saying that it wasn't as good as they expected and that it's overrated. Melanie said that at this point, she felt so devastated because it felt like she spent the last few years working on something that didn't turn out to be as good as she would hope. But then that wouldn't last long because on August 2013, when Canva did launch, everyone loved it. They had like 50,000 sign up. And well, fast forward to September 2021, Canva has more than 60 million monthly active users across 190 countries. They're hoping to exceed $1 billion in annualized revenue very soon. And there's around 500,000 teams paying for Canva in some capacity. Canva's growth rate is currently at 100%, which is truly incredible. It is one of the most anticipated IPOs, but no one knows when that's happening. That said, the story of how Canva was built is such an inspiring one. And that's about it. Now you know about the brand origin story of Canva. One of the reasons why I made this episode because I actually use Canva myself. I've been using Canva to make my YouTube thumbnails. My favorite feature has to be the background removal tool because it's so easy to use. It almost feels like magic. If you want to give Canva a shot, use my link below for a 30-day free trial. The time you save makes it absolutely worth it.